All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out here today. I don't know about you, but I'm not a morning person. And how many of you, like me, are not morning people? All right, so I'm not alone. So getting up early on a Saturday, you guys must be really interested in finding out about home ownership, huh? This is great. So the way this is intended to roll, folks, is just purely educational. Uh, my role here is to handle the real estate side of it, the market side of it, the home buying side of it. And then we have partnered with a wonderful lender, Cornerstone Home Lending, to go ahead and get into the specifics of what it takes to qualify and everything else. So we, there are no stupid questions, there are no dumb questions. I want you to feel incredibly comfortable. We're scheduled to go to noon. The way I typically would want this to work, ideally, is that we're done maybe 15, 20 minutes before noon so that we can take Q&A. And even better, if you feel like you maybe want to get this started, we can actually see about how, how far along you are in the qualification process. Does that make sense to you all? Any questions for me before we get started? Okay, anybody in the wrong place and want to get up right now and leave? <laughs> there have been times when we started a class and people say, isn't the one about, this is the one about uh, pipe fitting? Uh, no, that was last week, but you know, anyway. So again, welcome to our first time home buyer program. A little bit about myself and my background and what qualifies me to go ahead and be the instructor in this scenario. Again, Tony Martinez, I am the broker of Extreme Realty Team. We are obviously a real estate company. We are doing this with some motive, and that is if you are prepared at some point or now to enter into the home buying process, we would love, we would be honored to have the opportunity to represent you in this process. I have a little bit of a history when it comes to educating and training. I love it. I am a master short sales specialist. I have trained over 9,000 agents on how to do short sales. So if one of the scenarios that you come across is that the home you're looking to buy is a short sale, there are some nuances, some differences in buying a short sale as opposed to buying an equity property. Well, there are a lot of companies out there that do everything they can to discourage their agents from even touching anything short sale related. My agents are well trained and well supported, so that is an option for you. We want all the options on the table for you. Would you agree with that? I mean, if you're gonna look for homes, you wanna see all of them, only the ones the agents are comfortable showing you. Which one? Oh, no. All of them. Well, a lot of agents are not comfortable with short sales. Do we have any veterans here in the room? Anyone that has served our country you know someone that has? Well, I'm also a military residential specialist and instructor, which is a, a, a course that actually more, more of my agents have taken that course than any other single office in the country. And we believe that anyone that has served our country has the right to use their VA loan benefit. And that is a fantastic program for those that obviously qualify. We have three offices. This one here is headquarters. We have an office in Brickell and in Lake Placid, Florida. Anybody know where Lake Placid, Florida is? Mm -hmm. Great. I didn't for a while. <laughs> but it's just two hours north of here, and it's paradise. If you love boating, if you love lakes, if you love anything that has to do with a, a slower lifestyle, Lake Placid is the place to go. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so as far as how many agents we have to service your needs right now, we're a little bit over 130. Many of them are represented here in the room. In fact, how many of you were invited here by one of our agents here? So you know, they're committed to helping you. We feel that the first time home buyer is an underrepresented segment of the market. And it's just something that we are passionate to go ahead and help you. So what you will learn today is the benefit of owning versus renting. See, there's an emotional component to buying. I get it. Most people, given the opportunity, of course, would buy. But there are also financial benefits and reasons to own versus rent. Let's go ahead and spotlight those and talk about those so you can understand financially what you have to gain. What about knowing exactly where we stand on the real estate market? Would you like to go ahead and know that? Okay, or are you basing all of your knowledge of the real estate market on what you watch on TV? Because you know that's real. <laughs> you know that what you see on those shows, that's not even mentioned the network, because why give them any more advertising? Of course, that's real. All right? Next is where to begin. What if you're ready to go right now? What are your first steps? How do you get this whole process started? Selecting a real estate agent, or better yet, selecting a realtor. Often, we as real estate agents don't do a very good job of impressing upon consumers what it is that we do. For a lot of people, a real estate agent, someone that drives a Mercedes, talks on the phone as they're driving, shows up to closing and gets a big check. 
Don't raise your hand if you agree with that, okay? <laughs> In fact, it's pretty sad if one of my agents raises their hand and says, yeah, that's what I thought, and that's not true. There's a lot that goes into the process. And then obviously the financing options available. So my portion comes first, and I'm gonna turn it over to Cornerstone, and they're going to go over all the different programs that are available to you. Would you qualify for conventional? Do you need something on, as far as FHA? Maybe one of the programs on bond programs and down payment assistance programs. So we're gonna hit you fast and furious with a lot of information. In your bags that we gave you, are these bags cool? Did you got you got a bag, huh? Yeah. Awesome. Listen, don't put another company sticker over that, okay? That's uncool. But inside, there is a, a, a what do you call those things? A presentation folder. And we have in there uh, a questionnaire form that at the end you could choose to fill out and hand to the agent that's helping you here. And then the other one is seminar notes, so you have a place to write, so you don't have to write on the back of your hand because that, that gets messy when you're trying to uh, decipher those notes for later. We cool? All right, so owning a home versus renting. Let's go ahead and look at the many benefits. Number one is the opportunity to build equity. Now, one of the things I always try to make sure that I get across to consumers, uh, one of the things that I did extensively during 2008 to 2011 was travel the country teaching agents how to do short sales. For those of you that are not familiar, when you owe more on your property than the property can be sold for, you're in a, a short a situation, right? So selling that property requires a complex process to get the bank to approve it. Well, there was a whole lot of people that bought homes back in the day when every single day the property would go up by hundreds of dollars. You guys remember that market? And there was a lot of second, uh, home, uh, second home buyers and third home buyers and you name it. And people were really buying homes for the wrong reason. I think essentially the biggest reason why we buy a home is obviously shelter. And we want a place to call our own. We want to put down roots and we want to grow. The equity part, the amount, the, the, the amount that, the, that accumulates because prices are going up, please, please treat that as a bonus. Because then there's no way you're gonna be disappointed. The market goes up, the market goes down. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But traditionally, for 40 plus years and longer, one of the safest places to put your money has been in real property. And now we're seeing prices go up again, which is good and bad. When you're on this side of the fence, pardon the pun, and you wanna buy, you're seeing prices starting to go up and you're freaking out. Anybody freaking out a little bit? But you know what? We're gonna talk about how to make intelligent, non-emotional decisions. Now how can you make a non-emotional decision when it comes to the home where you wanna raise your family and put down roots? You have to, you have to. So anything you gain, from the equity, and if you're planning on living there for a long time, the odds are in your favor that it's going to go up in value. Now, if you're working with a real estate agent that is assuring you that your home or the one that you're gonna buy is gonna go up in value, may I make a suggestion, can you write this down? Dump that agent and go find another one. Because that agent has no right to make such a claim. If I had the ability to predict the market, would I be here on a Saturday? I'd be on a mountaintop wearing a loincloth. I know it's a scary thought. And people would be climbing up that mountain and laying things at my feet say, oh, Tony, where is the market going? <laughs> Come on. You know, there are two words I teach my agents to never use. <laughs> never and always. When agents say, oh the, oh, the market never goes down, or the market always goes up, you know what, run. Tell them, you know what, I'm gonna go to the restroom and then look for a back door and then run. You guys got that? Okay, good. Tax advantages. Well, one of the wonderful things about owning a home is that the interest that you pay, the property taxes that you pay on that home are tax deductible. So that is a way of reducing your tax liability which could save you thousands of dollars a year. Have you ever heard the saying that renting is like throwing money out the window? Yeah. You know what it's, uh, let me tell you the truth. You know what it's really like? Throwing money out the window. Have you seen that thing on the YouTube where it shows that little girl taking cash and just throwing it out the window? Yeah, that's what renting is. You're making a landlord rich. That landlord loves you. Because every day you're putting money in their pocket. 
Okay? What are you building for your future? What are you building for your nest egg, Renzi? Not thinking. It's time to change that. What do you think? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Personal lifestyle preferences. Well, you know what? Lake Placid is a, is, is a lifestyle. Let me tell you something. Anybody love clubbing here? Anybody like going out there and partying? Anything else? Come on, don't lie to me. Just because we're on Facebook, don't lie. Okay, <laughs> let's say you have friends that likes to party, okay? Don't move to Lake Placid. Uh, right? They roll up the sidewalks at what time? By eight? Uh, you better have dinner by six. <laughs> <laughs> now the folks in Lake Placid, I'm, I'm up there on Tuesday. Hey, no insult intended. It's a lifestyle. You go there when you want a slower pace. You want to get away from the hustle and bustle. So yeah, you're going to make lifestyle decisions. If you are a water person, you want to live by the water, then that's the preference you're going to make. You know? And here's something that I want to go ahead and mention now. When you're first starting out, you don't always get what you want. You got to start somewhere. You know, we always tell people, find out what they really want. Yeah, and then find out what they need. Because what you want and what you need can be two very different things. Your first home, you ever heard the term starter home? Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. The name of the game is to get in wherever you can get in at and then you start growing and building from there. It's a long-term process. Can you, you know, I don't know if you know this. It's on Facebook, so I shouldn't say it out loud, but there are some people out there that actually don't owe anything on their homes. <gasps> Can you imagine living debt-free? But yeah, there are people out there that pay off their mortgages and, don't, and then they're sitting on this home never having to worry about a bank taking it away from them. So there's 15-year programs, there's the more traditional 30-year programs. You can do techniques and strategies like starting off with a 30-year, making an extra payment every year, and watching the principal go down quicker. There's different strategies that if your goal is to be there for a while, you can go ahead and pay that down so you could eventually live debt-free. Any of this sound okay to y'all? Okay, they promised me a live audience. You guys okay? Is it I, I, I want to make sure, you know what, because sometimes the coffee doesn't kick in, the donuts, everything else. All right, pride of ownership. How do you put a value on this? You know, my parents, you know, brought myself and my brother over from Cuba when I was five years old. Yes, by looking at me, you're thinking 20, 25 years ago, right? Why are you laughing? What's up with that? That's just cold. No, 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 that's really cold. I mean, I can understand a slight giggle. I can understand maybe you rolling your eyes. But when you're just going, <laughs> that ain't right. Anyway, what was I? Oh, so I remember to this day when we bought our first home. And I remember it was good old days. $500 down on a $24,500 four bedroom, two bath in Carroll City. All right. And, 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 I, and, and I, yeah, I'm telling you. And I remember, I think I had like $20 saved up, and it felt so good that I contributed $20 toward the purchase. Then my old man said something that really hurt me. I don't think I've ever told my psychologist this, but. Um, at one point when he was talking about, hey, you know I'm the guy, I'm, the, I'm the, the dad. I go, yeah, but I gave money for this house too. And he goes, remember when I made the hole in the air conditioner? For the air? Yeah, that was your 20 bucks that we took out and it's gone. Never mind. But you'll catch that later. But it was awesome. It was so awesome to put down roots. And for us as immigrants, it felt like we had achieved the American dream. We, are really, we knew that we belonged. We knew that we had a place to stay. So the pride of ownership is amazing. Uh, you all of a sudden pay attention to your lawn. You, you, you pay attention. You're gonna, you know, your kids scuff up the walls. Because it's your wall. You know, There's a huge difference between renting emotionally, psychologically, when it's your property. Everything changes in how you look at it. How many of you would say that that's true? Okay, so you're obviously here today because you want to experience that pride of ownership. Uh, one of the most rewarding things for us as realtors is at, when we're at the closing table, and it is an emotional roller coaster, without a doubt. But when you get to sign those papers and we take a photo and we say, okay, this is how it begins. For any real estate agent worth their salt, 
it's all about that feeling. It's all about that moment when we helped, especially a first time home buyer, achieve that dream. Any questions so far? We're good? Yeah. Okay, so state of the market. Let me ask you something. Real estate agents don't answer. In fact, I gave explicit instructions to my agents yesterday. I said, don't ask any questions. This is all about you, the attendees. Okay, so this is about you asking any questions. So would you say that we're in a buyer's or a seller's market? What would you say? Seller's. Okay, you guys have been watching those cable channels. Oh. Uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it might actually be right every now and then. What does a seller's market mean? Anybody want to chime in on that? Um, oh, you don't feel so cocky now, do you? <laughs> where prices are, they can hold their prices you now based on what is going on in the market? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yes. There's not enough inventory and too much competition. Mm -hmm. Agent in disguise? No. No, you want to be? <laughs> no. It's absolutely true. Right now, and it all changes depending upon price point. You know, we see a huge difference once the property is over 345000 See, 345000 is the limit for FHA loans in our counties. So we see a dramatic difference once it's above 345000 because the buyer pool gets smaller. So what you have right now, let's just use the example, say 200, 250, 300000 There's a huge demand for homes. Guess what we don't have enough of? Homes. Okay. How does that make a seller feel when you have so many people after what you have? Yeah, it makes them feel great. And it can make them feel cocky at times. They have all the power. They have all the power. They have all the leverage. Why is this important? Because there's going to come a point in time when you are going to place an offer on a property and negotiate. And I don't think it's a good idea to enter into this negotiation acting like you're in control. Because guess what? You're not. If you cop an attitude, they have somebody else that's willing to smile and say, may I please have another? And they'll take their offer instead. That's one of the things that truly bothers me about our industry is that agents never really sit down buyers and explain how the market works. So buyers enter it with this attitude like it's on TV. Well, I want this and I want this and I want that and I want that. It doesn't work that way. So that can change and it has and it will, it's cyclical. But as of right now, in the price points we talked about, the agents have, the, sorry, the sellers have the leverage. So how do you overcome that? Work with a really good agent, listen to your agent, make good offers. Don't be going in there with an attitude like I'm gonna lowball and I'm gonna see what I can try to get from this person. All you're gonna do is make offers all over town that no one's gonna look at. And then always, always have the attitude of let's try to make this work. Does that sound fair to you guys? Okay, so where are prices headed? Again, ooh, Swami Tony. <laughs> right now, are they trending up? Yes. That can change. Okay, what do you think is going to happen as interest rates continue to go up? Prices are what? Don't have to whisper. Prices are going to go down. Well, what, what would drive those prices down? What do you think? The interest rates, and because if you refinance your home or do something and it's worth more, you kind of want to get rid of it. Okay, yeah. Now, let's look at it this way, right? You get this big pool of buyers, right? And interest rates go up. Are we going to have more or fewer buyers? Fewer. Fewer, because the affordability factor is lower. Fewer will qualify. So now we have fewer buyers demanding those same homes. So guess what's going to happen to the inventory? The turnover is going to slow down. Then sellers are going to realize, okay? But that's going to be a long drawn out process. So there's a saying, when is there a good time, when is, what is there, when is it a good time to buy real estate? It's always a good time to buy real estate if you're buying at the right price, okay? Buy at market or lower. Resist the temptation to overpay for properties. Buyers get emotional. I want this, I'll do whatever. Careful, you're already starting to head down a very dangerous path. So try to take a step back, and if your realtor is advising you to slow your roll, that's a good thing. A bad realtor will go ahead and go ahead and say, yeah, do it, do it, do it, because they, all they have is dollar signs in their eyes, and they want to go ahead and make a commission. 
If your realtor is telling you, hold on a second, that person actually cares about you and your future. That's someone I would listen to. Regular sale versus short sales versus REO. Ah, so this is what I like to do whenever I train my agents to meet with a buyer. Let's sit down and I tell my agents, I go, you know what? Let the buyers know that there's three different types of properties that you're gonna show them. And I'm not talking about condos, townhouses, and single family, that's a given. I'm talking about the market in general is divided up into three sections. Regular sale, regular equity sale, short sales, and REO. Let me give you a quick lesson. And this is how a real estate agent should approach it. Say, you know what? When the time comes to show you properties, I'm gonna go ahead and show you properties that are considered regular sales. What does that mean? That means that's traditional. The seller owes less than what they can sell it for. So when the seller sells it, they pay off everybody that they owe, they walk away with whatever they walk away with, and they go on to the other part of their life. The decision is solely between buyer and seller. Are you with me? Okay, now, a good agent, because they're not afraid, will also show you properties that are REO. Okay, so non-real estate agents, what does REO stand for? That's okay, I'll take this one. Okay, you take the next one, okay, promise? Oh, you would have had the next question. Okay, all right, REO stands for real estate owned. Real estate owned, this is a house that the bank foreclosed on. They foreclosed on it, they took it back, now they put it back on the market with a real estate company, and it's an REO. You feel me? So far so good? All right, so there's a certain percentage of the market that's REO, and there's good and bad. So if I were to go ahead and say, what's the good thing about a regular sale, just to keep the seminar going, I would say, a regular sale, I don't have to deal with no stinking bank. You're right, you don't have to deal with a bank. But with a regular sale, because so many agents are afraid of the other two categories, they only focus on regular sales, because people are afraid of short sales and people are afraid of REOs, they wanna focus on regular sales, so you have all this demand for regular ones and sellers get all cocky, all right? And then you have valuation issues because that seller thinks that their house is the most expensive house on the block. You know why? They used heavy duty nails. I'm talking about the regular ones. No, <laughs> heavy duty. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so heavy duty nails. How much does that add to the value, tell me? Nothing! <laughs> Nothing! Yet they think my house oh, is special. Look at that toilet. Have you ever seen one like it? And it says I have. You know, and that's what happens. There's good and bad when you're dealing with regular properties. REO, what's the good thing about it? Well, if I had to buy a property owned by the bank or uh, between an REO and a short sale, they move faster. Okay, because the bank owns it, the bank has a price in mind, match their price and you have it, right? And then, but what's one of the downside? Usually REOs are torn up. Majority? A lot of them, the people left mad. Yeah. <laughs> they left mad. I'm taking this kitchen with me. <laughs> it's not like this is my lamp, that's my sink. I'm taking it with me, oh yeah. And that's a good one. Let's not even talk about the ones that pour concrete down the, the, yeah, yeah. So don't buy an REO if you're not able to fix it up. And the reality is many of these REOs will not qualify for regular financing because they're not habitable. You can't get regular financing on a property if it doesn't have a kitchen, if it doesn't have a sink. So a good real estate agent, knowing what your financing needs are, it's not gonna show you properties that you obviously are not gonna be able to qualify for. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, then short sales. Short sales scare the bejeebies out of a lot of people because they don't understand the process. So in the short sale, we're still dealing with the seller, but then even if the seller agrees to the deal, it goes up to the bank. Now here's the deal, it may be listed for 200,000. You're thinking, this is a deal of a lifetime. I know houses in that market are selling for 275. This one's for two, let's get it. If that agent didn't explain to you, whoa, time out a second, something ain't right. Why is it only 200,000? I looked at it, it doesn't need $75,000 in repairs. I got a feeling that it priced 200,000 because A, the agent has no clue what they're doing, and yes, that does happen. Or B, they priced it as a strategy to get a quick contract to go in front of the judge to try to get the foreclosure delayed. 
a good real estate agent will know to warn you about that. You know what happens? Even if the seller agrees to the 200000 it goes up to the bank. The bank sends somebody out there to do an appraisal or it's a BPO. It comes back at what? Two seventy-five. dollars bank says, okay, we'll do the short sale, but only at two seventy-five. dollars Well, now you are not approved for two seventy-five. dollars You wasted two or three months of your life to find out that the bank wants a price that you can't handle. Is that right? No. But if you're represented by someone that doesn't know what they're talking about, that's what can happen. So here's the deal. Let's say these houses are identical, because they look pretty much identical, and they're side by side by side in a street. The house on the end is a regular sale, went on the market for 350. Now in the interest of time, I will tell you that not just consumers, many agents will get this price wrong for the REO. And many agents will get the price wrong for a short sale. I have said it is identical, identical, identical. If this one goes on the market for 350, this one should go on the market for 350, and this should go on the market for 350 because they're identical. But because consumers watch the cable channels and they hear stories of someone making a ridiculous offer and it gets accepted, that's how they enter the process. And if you're represented by a weak agent, the weak agent will say, whoa, whoa, time out a second. There's nothing wrong with this property. It's identical, everything. Why would the bank take less for that? They won't. How many of you are feeling this? Okay, so write this down, help me out. Forget labels, forget labels. Don't worry about a label about REO. Don't worry about a label of short sale. Work on, focus on condition of the property. If this property needs $75,000 in repairs, it should be reflected in the price. And if not, you can make an offer to the bank that reflects that. The same thing with a short sale. Folks, I gotta tell you something right now. What you all just learned right now is more than what 80% of real estate agents out there know how to say. And that's scary. Why am I saying this? Two reasons. One, I truly, truly want you to be impressed with this company and give us an opportunity to help you. But secondly, I'm so tired of people being hurt, their time being wasted, their feelings being let down because they were poorly represented. As an industry, we need to step up and make sure that that doesn't happen. Would you agree with that? Now you're thinking, I'm ready. <laughs> How many are kind of leaning toward being ready? Okay, where do you begin? Well, some of these decisions are obviously financial. Uh, sometimes a, consumers will make a decision based on what they can qualify for as opposed to what they really can afford to pay. And it's a difference. Let's say that you qualify for a payment of 2,500. Well, maybe you shouldn't go that high. So kind of have an idea in mind as to what you can afford. A good lender, and you're gonna hear from a great lender in a second, they're not gonna put you in a home that's gonna hurt you later on. But ultimately, you're the decision maker. You know how back in the day when houses collapsed and the market was a disaster? There was a lot of consumers that were mad at the banks. And I realized and I asked them, I go, did anybody ever put a gun to your head and say sign here? No. You're adults, you're entering in this, this is your decision. Choose wisely. Then we're gonna get into the mechanics. How many bedrooms do you need? Where? Are schools gonna be a factor? For how long are schools gonna be a factor? So a real estate agent, what we're supposed to do is we're the source of the source. We're the ones that can point you and say, well, if you wanna find out the school ratings, here's a website. And it tells you all of the schools that pertain to the house that you're looking at and what are the ratings of those schools. Is working, is living close to home a factor for you? Do you not wanna commute 50, 75 miles one way? Do you want a condo, townhouse, or single family? Look, the reality is everybody wants a single family. Most people want a single family. The majority of people want a single family. You know what I told you about what you want versus what you can have? Well, you know what? Have you seen the prices of single families? Yeah. You may not be able to get a loan for a single family out of the gate. So let's look at what other options apply. Now, let's say, let's say for example, you need an FHA loan. Carlene's gonna explain this, fantastic program. Guess what, it's a condo. It has to be approved for FHA. You know how many condos are approved for FHA in Broward County? Five. 
So let me ask you, would it be smart to use an agent that knew to ask this question ahead of time instead of a bunch of showing you a bunch of condos that you try to make an offer on and you can't buy because it's not approved? Yeah. These are the things you want to know ahead of time. That was just Broward. Miami is probably a dozen. A dozen or so? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is critical. Get pre approved before you ever start looking at property. A good real estate agent does this for a couple reasons. Yes. I'm sorry, so before you move on, I'm right? Yeah. So if it's a case where you're getting an FHA, you're more likely looking at a town home based on affordability. Yes. Yeah, affordability, condos and townhomes are going to be more affordable. And then the question becomes is when it's an FHA, is that condo or that townhouse approved for FHA? And many are not. Villas are considered single family. So then we have to start getting more creative and that's where you're leveling it. Maybe if you can put a tiny bit more down and you can qualify for say conventional financing with 5% down versus FHA at 3.5% down, that little nuance, that little difference might be what gets you into that property. Okay, so this is the conversation you're gonna have at length with your lender to make sure that before you see home number one or property number one, you're not looking at something that's never gonna be approved. One of my agents the other day received an offer on a property, and it's a condo. And I looked at the front page and it said 100% financing. I knew right away it had to be a VA loan. I looked on page two, guess what it was? A VA loan. I stopped right there. I went back to the agent and says, is your condo complex approved for VA? No. That agent has no clue what they're doing. Now it gets worse. That was the second offer that agent made for those customers in that same building. Imagine the, the hopes of that particular buyer being dashed because they're making offers on property they it's can't get. It's a waste of time and the emotions that are involved in it. So know all these factors before you go see property number one. And pick a good realtor. Now, I'm winding down, but why work with a realtor? Now, notice I didn't say why work with a real estate agent. Anybody got a rock? Now, why would you? <laughs> if you did, we gotta have a separate conversation, <laughs> okay? But let's say you were to have a rock, and look, size of that purse you made, okay? And I would take that rock and throw it toward a crowd, they would probably land on somebody with a real estate license. <laughs> How many of you, besides the agent that invited you here, know okay. someone that has a real estate license? Yeah, everybody has a real estate license, okay? So they're real estate agents, they're sales associates, but only a small percentage of real estate agents and sales associates actually can call themselves realtors. Because that means that we're members of the National Association of Realtors. So by its very definition, we have to adhere to a code of ethics. Now you have to understand something. This is South Florida. Okay, in South Florida, laws are only suggestions. <laughs> How many of you can understand what I'm talking about, right? So not all real estate agents are created equally. You want to find someone that is adhering to a code of ethics, that is willing to tell you the truth as opposed to what you want to hear, that isn't only focusing on the dollar signs in their eyes, but actually what your needs are. Next, one of the reasons why you hire an agent is because their knowledge of the local market. One of the first things I do when I train my new agents, I say, go out there, go look at 50, go look at 100 homes. How can you sell something you've never seen? Become familiar with the areas. Next, access to more inventory. Absolutely. We are part of the MLS. We have access to everything that's listed. And a good real estate agent will also show you properties that are not necessarily listed, such as for sale by owners and other properties. Next, knowledge of financing options. I try to get my agents to not become lenders. I would rather them work with qualified lenders but they of course should be able to give you broad strokes advice on what direction to go and the best advice a real estate agent can do. The best thing they can do is say, here, let me introduce you to my lender. Have a seat, discuss your needs. Once you arrive at a settlement there, then I step in. Negotiations is what we do. Why is it that high priced athletes hire an agent to negotiate for them paying say 10%, which equates to millions of dollars? 
you cannot effectively negotiate when you are emotionally involved in the transaction. You can't step outside of your emotion. Most of you are not necessarily good poker players. You're gonna walk in and say, I want this house. Guess what? That's not the way you open negotiations. You can go ahead and talk to your agent that way, but when you're going to the seller and say, I really want this house. I'm thinking, cha-ching. Your leverage is gone. Okay, so let someone do it. We've assembled a team of professionals because there's a lot of players. When you buy the property, you have to have it inspected. Do you have an inspector? Probably not. Okay, do you have a real estate attorney? Probably not. Do you have a title closing agent? Probably not. You know what? It's not what you do for a living, but it's what we do for a living. So we can point you in the right direction so that you're not wondering. <laughs> that is an actual. No, never mind. So then right here. Here's the really, really good news. In 99.9% .9 of the situations, the seller pays our fees. We're working for you for free. Let me put it in a technical way. That kind of sucks. Now for you, you know what a real estate agent does? We do all of this work ahead of time, hoping and praying that it closes so we can get paid. So we're vested in this. We're all in. We want to make this thing work. We want to help you work, make it work so that we can get paid, so that we can feed our families. So it's kind of a great thing when somebody works on your behalf and does all these things and somebody else is paying for it. Would you agree with that? Okay. The home buying process can be a tad complicated. One of the things that a good real estate agent can sometimes do that hurts them is they make it look like the process is super simple. It's not. For example, this is a hard to follow, but you know what? It begins with the interview, the pre-approval. Then we gotta look at homes, go ahead and tour some homes. We view the home, make a selection, then discuss what strategy. I gotta write up an offer. Then we gotta present the offer. What if the end? Then they go ahead and back. The offer is a positive. Then you gotta get there, you gotta deliver it to the title company. Then we gotta order appraisal, we gotta order the inspection. What if the inspection doesn't go right? What if we have to do the permit report? What if we have to negotiate after the inspection? And as you go through the process, there's so many ways that the whole deal can be tripped up. So many ways it can be tripped up. There's timelines here. We operate with contracts. Contracts have definitive deadlines. You have a home inspection period. You're one day over the home inspection period. You have no rights to ask for anything or back out. You want an agent that's paying attention to timelines. Understand something, when you're buying a home, it's a legally binding contract. Treat it as such. Don't be represented by someone that does not know what they're doing. How about this? In exchange for all the work that person is doing for you, work with only them. There's this thing called loyalty. I know, it's one of those words that pertains to another generation. But we ask for it. We expect it. Because we're going to put everything on the line for you. If we feel that you're not going to be loyal to us, why would we apply ourselves to helping you? Especially in a complicated market like this. Any questions on what I've covered? Mm, all right, selecting a lender. Anybody here gonna pay cash? That's okay, don't brag. Most of you are probably gonna to to go ahead and look for some kind of financing, right? And at this point, we're looking at, I qualify for conventional, but I qualify for FHA. Here's the deal, you're gonna pick a lender. When you pick a lender, we feel that you ought to look for different things. Are they enthusiastic and knowledgeable? Will they communicate every step of the way? Do they have the experience and knowledge? Will they devote the time? We had one lender that told us once, hey listen, tell your people, don't call me after 5 p.m. They call me after 5 p.m., I'm not taking the call. Okay, I don't know that then. I go, say what? <laughs> I go, are you kidding me? No, I understand their boundaries. You know, you wanna be time with your family or everything else, but not five o'clock. Those are banker's hours. You're a lender, mortgage lender, okay? So. Rates and terms, no one controls that. They're negotiable, right? Fees and costs. So here's the deal. At this point, my part of the transaction is done here, or the process, unless you have some questions. Yes? I wanted to ask, um, I don't know, so I'm asking, what's the difference between using a mortgage company and a bank? Okay, that's a wonderful question, best answered by Carleen. So listen, I hope I didn't bore you too, too much. My part is done. I'll be available afterward to answer any questions. 
but I hope I've given you some things to think about, especially when it pertains to what company and what agent to represent you. But now it's my honor and privilege to introduce Carly Massey. She's going to take it from here. Right here. Forward. Right there. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yay, I got a better good morning than you, Tony. I already got them all up. Hey. <laughs> My name is Carly Massey. I work with Cornerstone Home Lending. We are actually located right up the street off of Knob Hill and State Road 84. Uh, Cornerstone Home Lending is a direct national lender. We're located in 47 states. Our home office is in Texas, but we have four uh, locations here in South Florida, one up in Lake Worth, our Davy office and two in Miami and Coral Gables and Miami Lakes. Uh, so that means that we are licensed throughout the entire state of Florida. We're able to help you with all of your financial needs. A uh, little bit about myself, just so you guys know, uh, I've been in banking since 2003. I have worked from all the bank banks like Bank of America, bb and Bank Atlantic. I decided to set my roots in Cornerstone Home Lending about two and a half years ago when my uh, one of my partners, Danny, was my mortgage lender because I refused to go through bb and <laughs> So um, he actually closed on my property and a week later I became his LOA. So, you know, we have that family orientation in our, in our business and that's what we want to give to our clients. Uh, today's really what I want to do is just kind of give you guys an insight on what it means to get pre-approved. I know you guys have heard that a lot today and what's the difference between pre-qualifications, pre-approvals, where your credit needs to be, and I kind of want to give you an overview as to what it is to get pre-qualified. Now understand that the pre-qualification process can take as little as a week to get you pre-approved as long as a year. We work with clients for literally two, three years at a time to get them to where they need to be so they can find the home of their dreams. Okay, so I'm saying that because I don't want you to ever feel discouraged or I'm not ready yet. You're ready now because you're in this room and you're, you're willing to listen and get educated. Okay, so that's the first step of getting pre-approved. I wanna go ahead and go over, you know, what are your different loan options that are available for you? What are your down payment options? How's your monthly payment calculated? as well as how much income do you really, really need to get pre-qualified, what our interest rates are based on, and as well, what does your credit score need to be, okay? Uh, again, if you have any questions along the way, just stop and I will be more than happy to answer. Okay, so how do you get pre-approved, okay? You're gonna hear a lot of these terms called getting pre-qualified, getting pre-approved, okay? The biggest difference between the two is a pre-qualification is somebody, a bank, that is going to run credit. And they're going to base your pre-approval on that credit. They're not gonna look at documentation, they're not gonna look at anything else, and that's the difference between getting pre-qualified and getting pre-approved. Getting pre-approved means we're gonna go through a thorough analysis. We're gonna look at everything. We're gonna look at your bank statements, tax returns, W-2s, pay stubs, to really tell you exactly what it is that you're gonna qualify for, and then we're gonna talk about where you wanna live comfortably, like Tony said, okay? What do we need to get you pre-approved? Very few, very simple. You're gonna need your legal name based on your driver's license, social security, date of birth, where your where your currently employer uh, your employer is, and how much income you make. Okay, using those five things, I could go ahead and get you pre-qualified. Okay, we also at this time also determine where you are comfortable with as far as your monthly payment is concerned. Again, you could go ahead and get approved and you know qualify for a monthly payment of twenty five hundred. May not want to, it may not be where you want to live in. You know, you have life, you have families, you have food that you have to buy, gas that you need to get to work to. Okay? And we also make sure that at this time your credit is full. Okay? It's very difficult. Okay? And we, we get this a lot of times where people are like, I don't want you to run my credit. The reality is that getting your credit full ahead of time is one of the main steps of getting you pre qualified. Okay? What I will tell you is this, if you do find yourself in a position where you want to shop lenders, it is a claim to do that. We don't want you to, but you can do that. You have 30 days for it to be considered as one hard inquiry to your credit report, okay? So it's pretty much like a marriage, okay? Speak now or forever, hold your peace, you have 30 days to do it, <laughs> okay? And at that point, like I said, we'll go ahead and we're gonna ask you for some of the documentation that we require. So what types of loans are there? And 
this is pretty much just the main loans that are that we have available for you. We have an array of products, okay? But these are the ones that are really going to go to our first-time home buyers. The main one and the most popular one is obviously your conventional loan. Your conventional loan is really going to go as far as what you want to put for down payment. You can put down as little as 3% for some of the conventional loan products. Typically, they ask for 5%. And you could go all the way up to 20% down of the purchase price should you want to avoid uh, something called private mortgage insurance on a conventional line, okay? The loans on these, we can lend up to 424,100, which means that that is where your purchase price could be depending on where your down payment is, okay? FHA loans, which is a lot of times considered the first time home, owned, home buying loan. It's really not the case, okay? And just to clarify, a first-time home buyer is not considered that you can never own property before, okay? As long as you haven't bought a home in the last three years, you are considered a first-time home buyer, okay? FHA is for all types of home buyers, whether you're a first-time home owner, second-time home owner, it doesn't matter. Typically, we're going to put 3.5% down. However, the max loan amount for an FHA loan is 3.5%. FHA is insured by the government, and that's why it's there, and it's different from a conventional product, which you'll hear Fannie and Freddie a lot of the times with the conventional. And then you have your VA loans. Um, I think we established that we didn't have any vets, but if you were married to a veteran, or if you had a spouse who was deceased that was a veteran, you may actually qualify for a VA loan. They could, you can actually put as little as 0% down on those, depending on what the certificate of eligibility is. Now our jumbo products are really for anybody who's trying to buy for a home over 424,000. Anybody in the room that's trying to do that right now? No, good, okay, then we'll keep it going. <laughs> and then we have our funky loans. So our funky loans kind of go, fall into our condos and what we need to do and ways to kind of offset that down payment if we need to do some type of financing for your down payment. That kind of falls there. Typically it's 20% down, but again, you have outside options for you when it comes to that. So how's your monthly payment calculator? Okay, so this is what we're gonna, when we're looking at the numbers and we're evaluating your entire file and looking what's gonna be the max that you're gonna qualify for, this is what your monthly payment will consist of. You're gonna have your principal and interest that's gonna drive from the interest rate. Then you're gonna have your property taxes. Now your property tax is gonna be based on the home that you're looking for or you're looking at. Okay, one of the big things that you're gonna work with with your realtor is as they show you and they start sending you all these beautiful properties, you wanna look at the bottom part where it says taxes, as uh, HOAs, all those things, because that's gonna tell you exactly what is the taxes on that property. We calculate that into your monthly payment. Hazard insurance is really gonna be your, that's gonna be the area that's gonna change and you're really not gonna have a final figure in it until you're under contract and you find a home because you have to shop for homeowner's insurance. What we try to do is give you a realistic estimation of what it could be based on the house. You know, if we know that it's gonna need a new roof or is it a newer home, does it have impact windows? All those things will attribute to what your hazard insurance will be. And then you have your mortgage insurance. So again, depending on what type of loan product that you have, okay? Mortgage insurance is there because what they're looking at is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA said, hey, in the event that you decide to get up and leave and never step foot back in that house and you never want to pay it again, we want to make sure that we get our money back. That's what mortgage insurance is, okay? So that's not to say that that's the same at home as homeowner's insurance. This goes away if you're thinking about going into a conventional product. How does that go away? Once you reach 20% of the equity of the home, this will fall off automatically for you on a conventional property. On an FHA property, it does not. It stays throughout the life of the loan. However, it does go down in price the longer that you're pay as, as you're paying your loan amount. So the lower your loan amount, the lower the mortgage insurance will go on FHA. How do you get rid of that in an FHA property? You either sell your home or you refinance into a conventional product. And then we also calculate any homeowners association fees. So if you're looking at a home like a condo or a townhouse or one of these uh, uh, planned de uh, unit developments that have these HOA fees, we're gonna factor in that payment into your monthly payment. You're not gonna pay the bank that, but we're gonna calculate it into your monthly payment. Okay, any questions so far?
So how much income do I need to make? Everybody tells me that. How much money do I need to make? You're, let me look at your taxes and determine. I'm not a mind reader, and I wish I could be an accountant. I am half the time, but not always. So um, really what's going to depend on how much income you need to make is really going to depend on how much you owe as far as debt. Okay? We use something called your debt-to-income ratio to determine how much income you need. Okay? What is your debt-to-income ratio? It's actually in the next one. Okay? It's, a debt, it's a ratio to determine if a borrower can afford their monthly mortgage payment that divide the borrower's monthly mortgage debt by their pre-tax income, okay? So what does that mean? Example, if you have $1,500 worth of expenses a month, that includes your car payment, credit cards, student loan debt, okay? But if your income is $3,000, that means that your debt to income ratio is at 50%, okay? So let's take that example and go back to the slide. Okay, each type of product has a certain max ratio that you can hit. Okay, for FHA, the highest that it could go up is 57%. Okay, for conventional is 45%, and for jumbo is 43%. Okay, so again, we look at this example. If you're at 50%, which property are you going to qualify for? Which type of program are you going to qualify for? FHA. Okay. So that will determine a lot of times what different loan product you're gonna to go to. And we may not get to that point until we review your documentation. That's why it's very important that when you start your pre-qualification process, you're open to the idea of really listening to what your lender is saying and really talking through everything, okay? We always joke around saying that we're like doctors. You have to tell us everything up front. Because if we start finding out things halfway along the line, it's gonna completely change your direction of what we're getting you qualified for. So just think of us as your priest, your pastor, rabbi, whomever you had to tell us everything up front. So what are your interest rates based on, okay? Even though the Fed raised the interest rate, okay, a lot of the times when people have this misconception, the stock market does not run your interest rates. If you really want to get into the nitty gritty and get all technical, it's actually the bond market that really drives what the interest rates are, okay? So, for all my people out there that love to Google and go on Lending Tree and see what today's average, national average is, stop. It's not going to help you. It's going to complicate your life more and you're going to cry and then we're going to have to have that come to Jesus conversation halfway through your process, okay? What you want to look at is the bond market. What I recommend is to go to fha.gov and to go to fannymay.gov. Those are your websites that are really gonna tell you what the national average is, okay? And it's gonna, they're actually every hour, on every hour, they always are changing the rates and they're really gonna tell you what the national average is, okay? A lot of the times when you go to these lending trees and you go on Google and they, you, know, you type in interest rates for today, they're gonna base it on the best case scenario. They're literally driving that interest rate based on somebody who has an 800 credit score who's looking at a 15 year fix and is making about 120,000 a year and is buying a single family home, okay? A lot of the times that's not the case, okay? Unless you do fall into that and that's awesome if you do, but that comes far in between. Something else that really also drives your interest rate is the type of property that you're buying, okay? The banks are looking at interest rates and they look at the type of property as how much of a risk is this investment gonna be for us, okay? Typically, single family homes and townhomes are okay. If you're looking to purchase a condo though, they tend to be about a quarter to a half of a percent higher than what your national average is, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. And also, your credit score is heavily based on your interest rate, okay? You have three credit scores, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. We're gonna do the middle of the three. Okay, whatever your middle score is. If you're going on the loan jointly, it's gonna be the lowest middle score. That's what your interest rate is gonna be based on, okay? And I did put on the bottom here what our current rates are based off of yesterday's average, so you could kind of see. Again, interest rates do not get fixed right off the bat. You have to be under contract in order to start negotiating what your interest rate can be, okay? So when you're looking at your pre-approval phase, understand that that number, that interest rate, although a lender will give you one, it can change. It's not gonna go from a 4% to a 7% right off the bat. That doesn't happen. It's a gradual increase 
and it hasn't it hasn't increased. I think I want to say about three months ago was the last increase that happened by the Fed. So here's an example of what your credit score needs to be for each one of these programs. Okay, now typically for FHA it is between a 580. That's the lowest it could be. Okay, now having said that. There's contingencies to that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> there are additional factors that will be on that. However, if we decide to run your credit, okay, and you are not anywhere near what these numbers are, okay, we offer our cornerstone something called a credit expert where we pretty much give you suggestions on what you can do to help increase your credit score, okay? So if it is something that needs to be worked on, again, remember when I said we have people that have been on two-year plans with us? This is one of the reasons why. We work on credit. We make sure that they're paying what they need to pay off and bringing down the liabilities that they need to do. Sometimes if we can't do anything and that report doesn't suggest anything, we work with the credit analysis to help repair your credit to get you to where you need to be. Okay. So, this is what everyone loves to talk about, our down payment assistance program. I'm gonna at this time bring my partner, Ari, and he works a lot inside with me at Cornerstone. And he's going to go over with you the different down payment assistance programs, specifically for Briar County and Miami. Um, and ask him as many questions as you want, because I ask him every day, every hour. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? No. Hey, guys. Hi. Um, all right, so like Carleen said, um, one of the things that I specialize in our team is the, the low down payment, the down payment assistance programs, okay? So I wanna start off the conversation by saying that they are not for everyone. They don't fit in every scenario, and even if you can qualify for them, doesn't necessarily mean that you should use them. However, it's a case-by-case -case basis, and we're gonna talk through and help you understand what your options are side by side. So. With that said, there are a couple of programs. Uh, I'll start with Broward. There's a couple of programs that, uh, in the right scenario, are a great fit, okay? So one of the things that we do when we pre-qualify, that's always going to be the first step, okay? We're always going to start with, are you approvable for a loan in general? What do you need to get there? And if we're looking at down payment assistance, we're gonna talk through the additional requirements, because there are some additional requirements uh, outside of a general approval that you need to meet. So if we get past that step, we say, cool, you're approvable, all right? Now we're gonna talk about your options. So the first thing we're gonna look at with down payment assistance programs is that whereas Carlene described the minimum credit scores that are required to get approved for a loan, FHA is low as 580, uh, conventional is low as 620, VA is low as 600, the down payment assistance programs all have higher thresholds than that, okay? Um, the second thing that uh, is unique to down payment assistance programs is, as Carleen described, what's, what, which program do we usually do if we need a higher debt to income ratio? FHA. FHA. Jay, you know this already. Sorry. <laughs> um, for the down payment assistance programs, that's uh, kind of reset a little bit because the limit on FHA loans is 45%, not into the 50s. So the, the, the challenge there is that what it often makes FHA um, most appealing sometimes isn't quite as appealing when it is combined with the down payment assistance program. The good thing on the flip side is that conventional loans, which oftentimes you can go up to 50%, you can go up to 50% still with the down payment assistance program with the conventional loans, okay? Um, so the next piece is, uh, you know, in a normal conventional loan or an FHA loan, and you know, Carlene said, how many people here are making $120,000 a year and want to buy a $430,000 house? And there wasn't very many hands, um, which is okay. However, down payment assistance programs do all have income limits, and they do all have purchase price limits. So depending on where you are looking, that is something that we'll look at too. Again, the goal is to kind of narrow things down to fit you into the programs that make the most sense for you. Uh, and that you can qualify for, that you're eligible for. So, uh, without uh, without further ado, we'll talk about a couple programs that are local. I yes. have a question about the max uh, salary. Is that based on variable income or base income? Like um, base salary. The max oh, so depends by program, and that's a great question. So, some programs use what's called 1003 income. Okay, the 1003 is your mortgage application. 
all right? So it's anything we're using to qualify you. Oftentimes, we either only will use your base salary or only have to use your base salary. If you have other types of income, say overtime, commission, bonus, uh, a second job, um, we can't always use those depending on the scenario. Um, if we do use them, they go on your mortgage application. If we don't, and the, let, let's say you make 40 grand a year in base salary and $10,000 a year in, in, in bonuses, right? Um, and we get you pre-approved and realize that we don't need that $10,000 a year in bonuses. We're not gonna put it on there, because what it does is it triggers additional requirements for paperwork that are necessary, additional steps of verification to make sure that that bonus is guaranteed to continue. Um, so if we don't need it, we don't use it. If we don't use it, it doesn't apply to the income limit for some programs. Some programs use uh, your actual income, not just your credit qualifying income, and beyond that, some programs actually use your household income. So whether, let's say you live with your husband or wife, but only one of you guys is on the loan. Some programs, we have to factor in the non-purchasing spouse's income to see if you qualify for the program. Take another step. Let's say you've got a kid that's 18 plus, and he still lives at home, and he works at Publix, and he makes you know $1,000 a month or whatever it is. We've got to factor his income. Let's say mother-in-law lives with you, and she gets Social Security. Even if she's not on the loan, we gotta factor that income. So that is where the programs that use 1003 income, are a lot, which is just your, what's going on your mortgage application, have a lot more flexibility than the programs where we have to factor in everyone who's involved and everyone who's gonna live there, okay? Good question. Um, all right, so the first program I like to talk about, and the reason I like to talk about this one first is because it's legitimately free money. You don't ever have to pay it back, okay? So there's two grant programs that you have access to in Broward County, one in Dade County. There's one that's called the Own Opportunity Grant, okay? Even though it says Lee County, because that is the, uh, the Housing Finance Authority in Lee County, which is on the west coast of Florida, they run it, but it's eligible in Palm Beach and Broward County, okay? And that, depending on your credit score, uh, you can get a three or four or five percent non-repayable grant. So what does non-repayable grant mean? You don't have to pay it back. Exactly. So, what is 5% of, let's call it a $250,000 house? This is part of our pre-employment screening, in case any of you guys want to get into the mortgage industry too, you can do the math quick. $12,500, right? 5% of a $250,000 house. So, um, FHA loan, how much do you need for a down payment? 3.5%? Okay, 5% is gonna cover your down payment. There's some additional program fees that uh, you know come with all these down payment assistance programs, but at the end of the day, if you can get a 5% grant, that's gonna cover your down payment, it's gonna to start to chip away at your closing costs, and you don't ever have to pay that money back, okay? Why would, uh, why would, why would someone give away free money? What would someone want in return for giving you all that money and never wanting it back? You don't have to, um, you don't have to live there for a certain time, you cannot, turn it into a rental property in the future with any of these. So that's a good thought. Any other thoughts on why someone might say, hey, here's $12,000? Well, at the end of the day, guys, even though there's free money, there's never free money. So for that program and for the, 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 the grant programs, um, they come with a higher interest rate. So you get some money up front, but you're gonna pay more every month. Um, doesn't mean it's not a good option. It just means you have to understand what your options are and what you are giving up to get something. Every one of these scenarios, you're getting something that you need if you qualify and if it makes sense. You're giving something up to, okay? Um, so in that case, uh, those programs come with a higher interest rate. Uh, different on FHA than it is on conventional, okay? Um, cool thing about that program, purchase price limit is 317,000 in Broward or uh, Palm Beach County. So, you know, get a decent house and not get over the, uh, the purchase price limit. And the income limit for that program is very high. It's only 1003 income. In Broward County, it's over $91,000. In Palm Beach County, it's $98,000. So that program, loose guidelines, looser guidelines on the income, good purchase price limit to work in. Sometimes you see these like programs that are tied to a particular city. You might see those out there. We don't do them, we don't mess with them, and here's the reason why. 
One, a lot of times they have very low purchase price limits. Two, a lot of times they require not only a borrower approval, not only a lender approval, not only a property approval or an appraisal, but then the city has to approve it and inspect it. And it turns what is normally, a, it's oftentimes a 30 day process with us into a 30 week process with the city. So it's just, we don't do those, we focus on the ones that we know we can control. We can tell you, yes, you qualify, no, you don't qualify, and that's all that's gonna matter, okay? Um, so, Lots of income, good purchase price limit. Um, since it's a non-repayable grant, it comes with a little bit more uh, in terms of uh, interest rate on a monthly basis, okay? The next program we can do in, uh, in Broward and in Dade County is, uh, is a statewide program. It's Florida Housing Finance Corporation, okay? So this one is interesting. There's a couple different options. There is a $7,500, what is considered a uh, deferred loan, okay? So what does that mean? Uh, you can get $7,500 to use towards your closing costs or down payment. Um, so, let's start there. It's not going to cover everything, guys. If you have a down payment and a closing cost, it's not going to cover every penny that you need. But, it's going to get you part of the way there. Sometimes that's what you need to get over the hump and get into the house. Um, it's a 0% interest loan. So what that means is you don't ever make a monthly payment on that loan. Okay. However, when you sell the house, when you refinance the house, when you uh, transfer ownership, or when you pay off your first mortgage, if you make your payments on time for 30 years straight, at the end, you do owe that money back, okay? So it's someone basically fronting you the money to get into the house, and then at the end, you gotta pay it back. Again, 0% interest, uh, so that is, uh, that's the difference between the non-repayable grants and what's called the bond programs. The bond, you have to pay back. Um, seven, yes. And that's a conventional law? Conventional or uh, or FHA. There's conventional and FHA options there. And that is what kind of loan is it? What do you mean? The loan that you were talking about? Which one? The one you just was talking about you pay when you just sell. Those, those are called de they're de first. deferred loans or what's called silent seconds. Mm -hmm. They're silent seconds because it's a second mortgage on your house. But it's silent because no one's ever chirping in a year saying send me a month, uh, send me a payment every month until you get the end. So they're silent, they just exist there until the ownership has changed, okay? Can you pay them month after month, or do you have no. them until the end? No, the, the, those are so paid at payment? sale. You cannot pay that one back early. So um, you take your money if you have it early, like why you No, but why would you pay a 0% loan early when you could pay your mortgage early and have your 30-year mortgage that you owe four, four and a half, or 5% on? Why would you ever put money towards free first? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so there is a Florida Housing Finance. There's a $7,500 silent second um, that is available. The, cre uh, the credit score, minimum credit scores on that one is 640. So it's, you know, it's, it's not too far from the you know, minimum credit scores in general. Uh, they also, they have lower income limits though. So in Broward, the income limit in a one or two person household is $76,000. Three plus person household is $87,000. Uh, it's a little bit more in uh, Miami. It's 87 for a one to two person household and 91 for a, a three plus person household. Um, and the purchase price limit for that one is 317 on a government loan, that's an FHA or VA, and 388 on a conventional loan, okay? The last one I'm gonna talk about, guys, it's in the same family as the Florida Housing Finance Corp, but it's actually a 3% non-repayable grant as opposed to the four or five that comes with the other program. Um, so you might ask, why would I want to do a 3% grant where a four or 5% grant is available? Um, and the reason is, when you look at them side by side, there are some differences. So this one, first of all, it's, it's only 3%, and this is only conventional, okay? This one is a, a conventional product. There are some other closing costs that are waived, the document stamps and intangible taxes, which I know we haven't gotten that far into how much is, uh, you know, what are your closing costs gonna be? But there are a couple closing costs that uh, are waived on this program uh, that are not on other programs and are not on regular loans. And um, the purchase price limit here again is 388. The other thing that's nice about this program is it's statewide. So we can do this program in any county in the state. Uh, it's not tied to a specific county. So, um, you know, we talked about what we can do in Broward. We talked about what we can do in Palm Beach. Um, this one we can do anywhere. So let's say, Last thing, we'll talk about what we can do in Miami, right? In Miami, we can do this program. So we have a grant option in Miami. We also have uh, 
We also have a $15,000 silent second option in Miami. Um, so that's a lot of money to use towards down payment. And again, down payment and closing costs. Um, again, it's a silent second. It's got to be paid back at some point. But sometimes you make that trade off um, for, you know, what are you getting? And that one, the nice thing is the interest rate is about maybe an eighth of a point to a quarter of a point higher than if you weren't doing it. So you're not paying this huge premium on a monthly basis either with that program. So if you happen to be shopping in Miami or you know, know someone that is, that is a uh, that is a very nice program to be able to uh, to, to do. The uh, the purchase price limits are uh, the purchase price limits are the same as over three twenty five. Uh, yeah, three twenty five for that program. And um, the income limits are very are very similar to the other programs too. It's you know seventy. Seventy-five thousand for a one to two person family, uh, eighty-seven thousand for a three plus person family. So, just kind of tip of the iceberg there, guys. But the, the the point of the matter is that when we have a conversation, like Carlene said, you're going to tell us everything. The reason you're going to tell us everything is because we don't want to waste your time. We don't want to spend uh, time, effort, energy with you. Um, discovering what the options are only to realize at some point down the road when you're like, oh, by the way, I have to pay child support. Um, did I tell you that? I can't remember. Um, that is uh, gonna be a, <coughs> child support is just like having a car payment, it's something we gotta factor in. So, get it out there. We also ask the questions, because you guys as first time buyers, sometimes you don't know what you don't know and what questions you're supposed to answer. So that's why when we go through the application, and when we go through reviewing it with you, and we go through your options, it's very, very important um, to just to, to be upfront. We're, we're your friends here, and the more at the end of the day, the more you share, the uh, the more likely it is that you guys are going to become homeowners, um, and, uh, and to become homeowners without you know losing your hair, going gray, or uh, you know winding up in a, a mental institution from the stress of uh, buying a house. That's all of our goals, um, both working with great realtors and uh, and working with great lenders, is to uh, to get you there as peacefully as prompt as uh, possible. Um, so before I walk away. Any questions that I can answer on, on mm -hmm. bond, grant, down payment assistance programs? Yes? So can any of these programs be combined or they're just individual? You cannot, you cannot combine multiple down payment assistance programs. They are all programs that are essentially the loans that Carly <laughs> talked about before. A conventional loan, an FHA loan, a VA loan. They are all those loans that then have essentially an added element on top of it. So, um, but it's not its own loan, its own guidelines, its own program. There are some unique guidelines to them, but no, you, you can't you can't add four of these up and get a hundred grand. If that's the question. <laughs> um, any other questions? <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for your time. Uh, again, uh, I I did want to say um, before I turn it back over to Carlene, um, you know we do a lot of these classes and, and, and we we meet with a lot of people. Um, you guys have a really good resource of Tony and his team here in this room. Um, there are um, um, there are a lot of agents out there that don't know what they're talking about, but don't have the experience that you guys have here. So I just wanted to reiterate that too. Um, it's uh, it's very nice to see such a you know an organized team and an educated team. Uh, and I, I want you guys to know if you're new to the process, you got you got good people in this room to work with. So um, and uh, that's it. I'm here later if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. All, right. All right, folks, what do you think? A lot of information? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are at this point. Do you have any additional questions for myself or Carly? Okay. Yes, How sir. closing costs work? Is it always a certain percentage? That's a great, great question about closing costs. So the way closing costs breaks down is the costs that are associated with the seller and with the buyer. Okay, so of course you can get an estimate ahead of time. So let's say in Miami-Dade and Broward, the biggest expense you're looking at from a closing cost standpoint, and we're not talking about related to the loan. To the loan, that's, that's separate. But you need title insurance. So you need title insurance that was, goes ahead and protects you that you are getting clear and marketable title. In Miami-Dade and Broward, the, the buyer is responsible for the title insurance. Then you have other fees that are associated with it. For example, you're going to want to do a home inspection. Do not buy a home without a home inspection. That is a buyer expense. The appraisal is a buyer expense. And then there are other 
miscellaneous fees associated with it, including a settlement fee, but you can ask for a preliminary HUD or closing the, uh, disclosure that breaks it all down for you. Did you get into potential seller contributions as well? We did not. Okay. So, because we were talking about the down payment right. assistance programs, but for closing costs, okay, if you're short on cash and let's say you decide not to use any of the down payment assistance programs, but you need, you're short on funds to close, we do offer lender paid credit, okay? Again, kind of to touch on what Ori says, there's never anything that's free. It's pretty much you're incorporating it as part of your closing cost into your interest rate and into your monthly payment. Again, we talk about that ahead of time so we know exactly what we need to work with. Now, if you're in also in a position where you're still short, as a realtor, you wanna have that conversation with your realtor to see if part of the negotiation can be seller contributions. Sometimes sellers just really want to get rid of that house and they don't, you know, there's wiggle room there that your agent can go ahead and consist of and get that seller contribution. Yeah, and that really goes back again to the seller's market that we have right now. So let's use a scenario. Let's say the property is 250000 and they have multiple offers and your offer is you're asking them to contribute 4 or 6%, right? Well, that comes off the top of their earnings. So they're gonna look at that situation and say, well, I have all these other offers that are not asking this of me. It doesn't make any sense. Now, sometimes a seller will make a decision for purely emotional reasons, not necessarily economic reasons. That is what, we'll write this down, this is very, very important. When you submit an offer, make sure you are also submitting a handwritten personal note to the sellers. You wanna include a note to the seller. It seems old school, but it absolutely works because they may be in a position where it's not about how much money they net. They may be retiring, all, all that's taken care of, and they can sense or feel like, hey, that was us. Remember us 20 years ago, 30 years ago when we were getting started? And that can make all the difference in the world. If you are going to make an offer where you're asking for a seller contribution, don't add insult to injury by saying, hey, you know that offer price? How about if you take $25,000 less and on top of that, go ahead and give me 4% for a closing. Well, how's about we just go ahead and not even try that because it's not gonna work. So within reason, you have to look at fair market value to do those things. So, but it is definitely an option to go ahead and at least ask them for that. All they can do is say no. Or anytime there's an offer, there's three situations that happen with an offer, right? They can either accept it, reject it, which doesn't usually happen, People usually either accept it or more often than anything else, they're going to counter. And that's where the negotiations come in. You want to have it in the hands of someone very capable. Does anyone answer your question? Okay. Any other questions there? Let's do this. Then in the time that we have left, what we can do is don't go running off. Whoever invited you here, all right, and if, if someone didn't invite you per se, we are, all of us are available to answer questions. We break off into little groups here. We have the conference room on the other side. We have a conference room over here. We also have an area in the back there. Go at least and get your questions answered. Don't leave here without making sure the majority, if not all of your questions are answered. All right, folks? Thank you so very much for having the opportunity to go ahead and share this with you. All right? Great. All right. Thank you.